Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Total War Warhammer 2 Law and Army Dogs of War video. And this is part two, so we'll be looking at the legendary lords for the Dogs of War potential DLC faction, and we'll discuss about some of the more kind of general uh, leaders of the army and the roles they can play, kind of distinguishing the different types of generals and the different types of heroes in a potential Dogs of War army. Now, in part one, we went over the different regiments of renown in Dogs of War army kind of the legendary regiments and why they're famous and what they're known for i do recommend you check that out guys do uh, click on the top right hand corner now or look for a link in the description below to check out part one and in part three we will look at tilia itself the country the cities and the more general units that are used within the tilian armies but that will be in part three today we're just looking at generals the heroes and the legendary lords. But let's start off with mercenary generals. Now, mercenary generals are just kind of atypical generals. They have very similar stats to, I think, empire generals at the time uh, they were released. Now, what I see Creative Assembly doing here is perhaps doing the same thing they've done with the Elves, where you have perhaps a melee general and a missile-focused general, and splitting them up like that for a bit more um, sort of differentiation between the types of general in Total War Warhammer 2 of this potential Dogs of War faction. But moving on from non-specific generals, let's go on to some of the general characters in the Dogs of War army. Now, we'll be starting off with perhaps the most infamous mercenary general of the Warhammer world, and that is Borgio the Besieger. Now, very little is known of Borgio before the time he took over the Principality of Miragliano in the northern part of Tilia. He is just kind of recognized as probably the leading mercenary general of the time. And so he took over and besieged the principality, taking over the city and running it as his own from that day forward. That was around the year of the imperial calendar 2483. So around 20 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline. Now I've had a few questions people have asked previously how I take the Total War Warhammer timeline. Well I start really from the point of the coronation of Karl Franz which happened around the year 2502 I think of the imperial calendar. It's either 2,500 flat or around 2,502. So, about 20 years before that, Borgio has taken over the Principality of Miragliano. Now, he started to run it like his own. He starts to raise a huge Dogs of War army made up of very different mercenaries, built around armies of pikemen, and he began to build himself a reputation as the ultimate sieger. Now, his army had developed such a reputation that very few enemies would come out to meet him in battle. So they'd learn to hold up in their forts and castles and what have you. And because of this, he became an expert at breaking down walls, at learning to undermine walls, just dig them out, and could take any city. It said, in fact, every city he besieged, he took, without exception. So in this fact that he went on from taking over the Principality of Miragliano, he won what are described as three famous victories. Now, we're not exactly sure where those famous victories took place, but that kind of cemented him as the most powerful Principality of Antilia, taking over vast regions of territory. Now, at some point over his illustrious career, he did take over and have a siege and a fight with every single Principality in Tilia. Now this built him up a huge number of enemies and these enemies as is very often the way in Tilia would send assassins they tried to kill him and it said that Borgia besieger was practically unkillable. They just couldn't do it. Assassin's poison wouldn't work. He'd dodge it. He'd find out about it. He'd just survive attempts on him. There was this ongoing rumor that he was just unkillable and that persisted for a number of years as he lay siege to increasing amount of cities increasingly solidified his reputation and had an active role in the formation of, of a number of the regiments of renown within the Dogs of War army, which we covered in part one. If you guys haven't seen part one as of yet, uh, do check the top right hand corner now or you'll find the link in the description below. And that speaks about some of the more famous units in the Dogs of War army that have had dealings with Borgio the Besieger in the past. So he's built up this sterling reputation and he lives a life of adventure and danger, not only besieging settlements and taking cities, but at some point he's actually rumored to have been captured by the pirates of Sartosa, who we do see appear in Total War Warhammer 2. Now what these pirates had began to do was just sort of capture him and they just put him in a very high tower. 
But him being the man and the kind of unkillable man that he is, managed to break free, and it said he kind of swan dived off of this tower into the ocean, a kind of feat that no one thought anyone could survive, but indeed, he managed to do it, and he escaped. Having escaped, he returned home, raised a huge army, and marched back on Sartosa, kidnapping the pirate princess of the island. He then held her to ransom, and made just a shed ton of money off the pirates for the safe return of their princess. The lesson being, don't kidnap Borgio, he'll just kidnap your princess and take all your money. So, don't mess with Borgio the besieger. As well as having a huge number of dealings with regiments of renown, he's said to have developed a lot of new technologies himself, often using the manuscripts of Leonardo the Marigliano uh, to just kind of make up these new siege weapons that would really help him defeat any of his enemies. In life, he's described as just this hugely muscular guy. Um, he's said to have wrestled lions for fun, but also a creative sort, writing poetry on the side, you know, to just pass the time and to, you know, express his more sensitive areas of his life. He's said to have inspired huge amounts of leadership, leading often from the front in all of the assaults on these cities, and really setting the example for his men, whether it be leading an assault or being the first to start digging tunnels underneath walls to undermine them and have the walls collapse. He was always at the front, always volunteering, always being seen to help out the army, and this inspired huge amounts of loyalty among his own men. Eventually, he's said to have met and married a woman by the name of Dolcetta, who was the sister of a famous sorceress in the area known as Lucrezia Belladonna, and the woman known for using poisons on many occasions, and is kind of greatly feared for her poisoning skills in Tilia. Now, an important aspect about Borgio the Besieger is that he is in fact dead at this point. Despite having forged this reputation as being completely unkillable, around the year 2503, so about a year after, a couple years after the coronation of Karl Franz, Borgio the besieger is poisoned. Now it's thought the method of this poison delivery was a little bit strange. He was said to have been stabbed with a toast fork. So very little implement to kill such a huge and infamous man, but that's apparently the way he went. Now, despite having had this reputation as unkillable, he is indeed reported to be dead as of the current Toast Warhammer timeline. Uh, but you know what, that gives him about a year in between, so you can kind of rewrite history, I suppose, in Total War Warhammer a little bit with him maybe not being dead at all. Now, the fact that he was poisoned has led many to suspect that indeed the sister of his wife, Lucrezia, might have something to do with it, and that maybe some ill part of their marriage had played a role in his death, despite all the fact that all these other dukes, all these other princes couldn't get anywhere near him. It may have been someone related to his wife who absolutely managed to deliver the final killing blow on Borgio the besieger. Now his bodyguard at the time was a chap by the name of Vespero and we spoke about Vespero's Vendetta which is a unit of duelists who have vowed to avenge their previous master Borgio in a kind of traveling the world looking to find out who killed him uh, in our last video in part one but just bear that in mind that this is the guy they are trying to avenge who is Borgio. In terms of his appearance he was a huge robust man as I mentioned previously. He would often ride a barded warhorse into action and he had a couple of special items about him as well. First, he had his huge club, which was his mace of might. Now, this was made from an enormous cannonball that had struck him bang in the chest during the Siege of Remus and had just kind of lodged itself in a dent in his breastplate. Now, he thought this is a huge bit of good luck and he decided to forge the cannonball into a mace and that's what he wields to this day. Now, what this mace effectively did was give him a boost to his strength. So, I suppose a translation from the tabletop to Total War Warhammer would be a weapon strength bonus for the mace itself. Now, the mace was known as the mace of might obviously with the increased strength um, but that's what his weapon did now you could maybe give it an element of like some kind of lucky charm or something as well to add to it something like that give him a um, perhaps a melee defense bonus due to the luck aspect something or even a missile defense bonus that might be fun as well in terms of his armor the armor plate he wore that day that saved him from that cannonball is still the armor he wears now it is known as the armor of brazen bronze the idea is that Tilians, which we'll go into a little bit more in part three when we discuss uh, Tilia, its history, its culture, and its kind of more general army units. Um, but the Tilians tend to say that they are descendant 
from the people who used to live in what is now known as Skavenblight, the ancient city where human and dwarves lived together, collaborated, and had huge amounts of wealth in ancient times. Now, it's more likely that these guys were just kind of the old farmhands of this old civilization rather than the important people within the city because they were all killed by what would eventually become the Skaven, but that's where they claim heritage from. And so the Blighted Marshes to the northwest of Tilia itself are kind of like thought of as kind of their origin point, their sacred site, and in dredging the marshes, not necessarily going near Skaven Blight, because they would be killed by Skaven if they did that, but just the marshes around it, they managed to uncover these statues of this metal that they'd previously never managed to replicate or manufacture, this very kind of hidden knowledge metal, and they melted down those statues and formed Borgio's armor out of it. So this is why his armor is so strong. Now, in the tabletop, what this armor did was kind of manage to ignore strength bonuses from different items and stuff like that. That's not easily translatable into to Total War Warhammer 2, uh, what you'd have to do, I guess, is maybe give it a magic attack defense or something like that. I think that's what that arm would probably most likely do. But you could kind of do whatever you want with the armor, just make it a very good, very strong armor. There's not a lot, there's a lot of leeway there for armors be, to be put together. He also has what is known as the Monstrous Mask Helm, which is this kind of terrifying mask that he wears as a helmet, and that just causes fear. That's what that item does. So he has those several magic items that he uses. He also has the rule Unkillable, or something like that, which relates to how hard it is to kill him, apparently not unless you're wielding a poison toast fork, but other than that, very hard to kill him, and the idea there was when he was down to his last remaining wound, which are essentially like, let's say, his last hit point, um, and someone hit him, him, he'd get a special save that was a 50-50% chance to uh, save him from that last wound, which is better than his usual saves against armor and stuff like that would generally be. So that's what he got as his special rule. It would be saved against anything, magic, whatever. So that's maybe more like a ward save that he might be able to get is his unkillable rule. I'm not sure if it was unkillable precisely. It was something along those lines. But those were the special rules for Borgio the Besieger, a monster of a man, fantastic guy, a huge fun to play with. And I think the bonuses to besieging and stuff like that could be uh, really interesting. Make it so that instead of like six or seven turns to starve out a city, he can do it maybe half the time. That would be a fascinating mechanic to see play out in Total War Warhammer 2, both on the Vortex map and in the kind of grand campaign of the combined map. So really looking forward to seeing if they implement him. I think Borgia would be probably the most likely choice for a pure melee uh, character legendary lord for the Dogs of War. So um, hopefully they make him, despite the fact him being dead in the later Warhammer timeline, at the time that Total War Warhammer is based, it would kind of make sense that he's still around. So that's Borgio the Besieger. Now the next legendary lord for the Dogs of War we're going to be looking at is Lorenzo Lupo. Now... To understand Lorenzo, we need to understand a little bit about the history of his city and his principality, which is Lucini, which appeared in Total War Warhammer 1, and I have no doubt will appear in the combined map for Total War Warhammer 2. But Lorenzo essentially descends from the founders of this city. That's his idea. That's what his kind of PR image is trying to sell to people. But Lucini itself is said to be founded by two twins, much like our, the idea of the mythological founding of Rome itself. Now, these two twins are said to have been either orphaned or abandoned or whatever, and they were raised by a leopard, which started a whole religious cult around the, the idea of the leopard, which kind of ties into the origin of uh, Leopold's Leopard Company, which is a regiment of renown we covered in part one. But anyway, the idea is that this leopard raised them. These two twin brother and sister went on to found the city of Lucini. Ever since that point, ever since the founding of the city, the idea of who runs the city has been kind of in dispute. So the brother and the sister each go off, they marry people, they each have their lines of family. And each of these warring clans have, over the centuries, been fighting amongst themselves to find out who should run the Principality of Lucini. It's been an ongoing feud, ongoing battles between these two houses. Now, what Lorenzo did is he came up and he said, look, I've done my ancestry chart. I've been onto Ancestry.com or what have you. And I found out that I, Lorenzo Lupo, am the first potential leader of Lucini who has descended both from the brother and the sister, therefore I have the right to rule, all other claims are forfeit. Now others had a bit of a problem with this, including uh, Leopold, who began to say he should run it, 
starting a whole confrontation with the Temple Guard who would go on to become known as Leopold's Leopard Company. He eventually managed to come to a truce with these people who refuted his right to rule, and as long as they agreed to leave the city and never wage war against him. So Leopold, who was another claimant to the Principality, left, leaving Lorenzo to run Lucini as he saw fit. Now, the problem with Lorenzo is that, like Borgio the Besieger, he too is a melee-focused lord, and I don't think Creative Assembly would give us two melee-focused lords as the legendary lords for a faction. One of them will probably have to be different in some kind of way. So I think we'll either get Borgio or we'll either get Lorenzo Lupo. Now, one fun aspect about Lorenzo is, because he has this kind of high heritage of since the foundation of the city, he's kind of obsessed with the idea of Tilly antiquity. Now, Old Tilia is very kind of reminiscent of the Roman Empire as we know it today, thus Creative Assembly would not have any trouble like making his troops into a very sort of distinct army. But the idea of Lorenzo is he collects ancient artifacts, he's a huge art collector, and he wears, the reason he looks the way he does, is he wears all of this really old-fashioned armor, which is more Roman legionnaire looking armor. So that's why he looks the way he does. All in all, he's this kind of eccentric art collector, but also also a brilliant athlete. He's said to be probably one of the best athletes in Tilia, if not the Warhammer world itself, but he always insists on fighting on foot. He doesn't have a mount of any sort, he likes to be on foot, that's the way he prefers to fight, and indeed he has a special rule around him. He has a special rule around his athleticism as well. So in terms of his sort of insistence on fighting on foot, that gives him a bonus because the idea is that any regiment he's attached to, because on the tabletop you can attach a hero to a regiment, gets plus one what's known as combat resolution. Essentially, as far as anyone, if you guys haven't ever never played the tabletop or anything, effectively what that would mean is a morale boost because he's on foot with them, he's not off riding a dragon or a horse or anything, he's with the boys, down in the muck, getting the butcher's work done with them. And so that gives them a bit of a morale boost. The idea of him being a mighty athlete would have kind of different random aspects to him when he was fighting on the battlefield. You'd effectively roll a six-sided dice and you'd see what you'd get to see what bonus he'd have. I think it was for the battle rather than for the turn. I think it was for the battle. So if you rolled a one or a two, you'd get his attribute that he'd been training particularly in running that week and so would get a extra point of toughness because he'd been training so hard at running that that's what he'd got as a bonus. On a three to four, you'd get that he'd been wrestling that whole week. That's what he'd been training on recently and that would give him a bonus attack. Um, and on a five to six, he'd have been weightlifting. So that would give him a bonus to his strength. Now, these could be essentially parts of an upgrade tree in Total War Warhammer 2. That's how I see it playing out if they introduce Lorenzo Lupo. The running would be an upgrade, the wrestling would be an upgrade, and the weightlifting would be an upgrade. And let's say that would be, so toughness would essentially be, let's say, melee defense. I think that's probably the most accurate translation, I think, for toughness. Um, attack, the bonus attack would be, oh, that's a hidden stat, that would have to do with speed. So I guess I would have to give him a melee attack bonus, so more likely to hit. I think that's probably the best translation of a bonus attack in Total War Warhammer. And the weightlifting, plus one strength, weapon strength bonus. Now, you'd probably be able to upgrade all three of those attributes in the upgrade tree. But it's a fun little aspect to think of, that he's kind of this Olympian-level or ancient Olympian-level athlete that trains in different areas. And it would give him a different bonus to um, himself, depending on what he was training on at the time. So that's kind of a fun little aspect about Lorenzo Lupo. He also has magical items. He has the uh, Sword of Lucan. Now, Lucan was the male uh, ancestor the male brother of the twins, and it has this very ancient snord that's said to ignore the effect of magical armor. Now, we've not seen an item in Total War Warhammer that ignores the aspects of other items, so I don't think that's the way the sword would translate. I think rather it would be that the sword would have armor piercing and perhaps magical damage. I think that's how they'd translate the Sword of Lucan. Now he also has the Ring of Lucina. Now Lucina being the female of the twins in the story of the founding of Lucini. Now Lucina's ring essentially is the spell of the glamour of Lucina, which serves to be able to rally units within eight inches of the user. Now in Total War Haram, that would effectively be a bound spell that could allow you to rally troops and make or make troops unbreakable something like that within a certain radius of your character. That would be a fun little aspect to have. The last item is the Shield of Mamidia. 
Now, Mamidia, if you guys will remember from some of my other videos, is the goddess that the Knights of the Blazing Sun worship. And I believe it was in Tilia where the Knights of the Blazing Sun were fighting. They'd been surrounded, and one of these statues fell on top and killed the uh, sort of invading, uh, I think it was the troops of Araby at the time, and killed them as these knights were surrounded. Thus, they went on to worship this goddess and became the Knights of the Blazing Sun. But he has this at shield of the same goddess, and that dazzles units, and they lose, you'd have to roll a three-sided dice, and they would lose uh, D3 attacks at random. So that would effectively be a negative trait to melee attack in Total War Warhammer. That's the way that rule would probably translate. And that's kind of a fun idea that around him, they get maybe negative six melee attack. I think one of the items already has that in Total War. You could maybe make it a bit better than negative six. But you guys get the idea. So those are his three magic items. He's a fun little character. I love the way he just looks like an ancient Roman general. I think that's really good fun. You could really do some great stuff with this shield, make it like a blazingly golden shield, a very bright shield. Um, and uh, that's about it for Lorenzo Lupo. Not a huge amount of stuff, just an eccentric guy who really loves the ancient ideals of Tilia and kind of lives his life by them. And if he wasn't such an effective and good general, people would just think he was an eccentric loony and probably write him off. But the fact that he is such a good fighter and such a good general means they do have to take him seriously. Now, this next one's a bit of a weird one. It's Marco Colombo. Now, Marco Colombo was a merchant who traveled a lot of the old world. He hails from Tilia originally he went down did a lot of business with araby opened up a lot of new trade routes became a very famous merchant in his own right now he isn't actually known as a mercenary general he's described in the army book as a merchant prince but he's kind of fills the slot of the mercenary general that's we're covering him in this part of the video but there's a whole bunch of caveats with this character, which is why I think he may not appear. But if they want something different in Total War Warhammer 2 as a legendary lord, he might appear. You never know. Um, but he's kind of an interesting guy, so I thought I'd go through him anyway. So having set up all these princes, he becomes individually wealthy. And much like our own world, Christopher Columbus set out to discover the new world. And indeed, he did go and he did find Lustria. And he is the first human to have ever opened up negotiations and indeed negotiated trade with the Lizardmen. So he did this. Eventually, he amassed so much wealth trading with the Lizardmen that he bought himself a princedom within Tilia, taking over the Principality of Trantio. He did return to Lustria many times. He was eventually trying to find the lost uh, Norse settlement of Skeggy. And indeed, eventually, he did find Skeggy itself and put it on the map for kind of the old world, the empire for everybody to find out about. And he's the one who kind of opened up all these avenues of exploration. Now, the problem here is he did this all in 1492, which is about a thousand years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline. So that's a long amount of time to have passed. I believe that's that timeline may have changed, but that was the timeline given in the old Dogs of War book. But Marco Colombo, thus being long dead at the time of Total War Warhammer, may present a couple of problems. But the idea that you can have this merchant prince character who could have maybe a huge diplomatic relation boost with the lizard men is a fun notion to play around with in the Total War Warhammer campaign. I like that idea. It does add something very different. Plus, you could give him bonuses for naval movement, all kinds of stuff like that. You could really play around with him and distinguish him from someone like Lorenzo Lupo or Borgio the Besieger. But there's not much else to his story than that. That's about it for Marco Colombo. He's the guy who discovered Lustria. Um, he has a friendly relationship with the lizard man. He's done business with Araby, with Sartosa, with a lot of these different parts of the Warhammer world. And that's kind of his whole deal. He does have weapons. He usually rides. He can ride it on a horse. He can be mounted. He can be armed with sword, lance, crossbow. And now the crossbow opens up a very interesting aspect of him, being that you could make him the kind of mi uh, missile-focused legendary lord as a juxtaposition to someone like Lorenzo or Borgio. Um, but he also has a shield and can have light armor. He's a marksman, which gave him the ability on the tabletop to move and shoot. So he could shoot on the move, which is an interesting aspect for him to have as well. And um, he's said to have a couple of magical items, including his navigator telescope, which would give him um, on a chance, a 50-50 chance, to see hidden units. So stuff like that you could hide on the tabletop, stuff like fanatics. 
um, and assassins, which normally you wouldn't be able to see. They'd be hidden in a regiment, and so they wouldn't show up on the tabletop. If he rolled a 4+, plus, the person on the opposing team would have to tell the player where they were hiding those units, and so he could discover them with his telescope, which is kind of a fun notion, and an idea that he would negate the stalk ability with any army he was in is a fun aspect to think about in a Total War campaign as well. But that's Marco Colombo. He has a couple of other magical items. He has something known as the Gem of Lustria, which is a polished green gemstone um, made into the shape of a snake's tongue. And this usually gave him a chance to re-roll armor saves. So increased armor protection, I guess, is what that gave him. And he also has the Gourd of Lustria, which would contain some kind of cactus juice, which for the lizard men would be nothing more than a kind of like orange juice supplement. But for a human, it effectively made them drunk as balls, excuse the language. And so what this does is the idea that it would just increase your strength. You'd go into like a lunatic drunk berserker phase and you'd get to increase your strength for a duration of time. He could still have that potion, maybe give it one use like many of the other potions in Total War Warhammer at the moment. And uh, that would be a fun little thing for him to have, the Gourd of Lustria. Now, his last item is something known as the Scroll of Araby. Now, Marco managed to pick up this scroll when he was going through uh, Araby, and he stopped off in the bazaars of Le Chic. And here, Marco sort of went into the bazaars, looking for different maps of different areas to try and open up new trade routes. And he found himself looking at this scroll that had been kind of partially obliterated, but had this ancient Kemri writing on the reverse side of it. And ever since then, he kind of kept hold of it, and it's giving him a protection against magic. And, and it gives him protection against magic. However, every time he uses it, a little piece of the parchment crumbles away. So it's getting ever smaller and smaller, this ancient scroll he has, every time he needs to use it to protect himself against magic. Magic's intended to do him harm. So it could be that the scrolls give him that in Total War Warhammer. Now, as I said, there is the huge problem that he lived about a thousand years ago, but one could argue, I don't know, maybe he's been living in Lustria, been, his life's been elongated by some kind of lizard man magic. Who knows? You could do all kinds of weird things with him, but I think he offers such like a different aspect and a different perspective of a legendary lord for the Dogs of War that he might be included. It's a long shot, but you never know. So that's Marco Colombo for you. So moving away from characters that are generally perceived as mercenary generals, we move on to the Paymasters. Now the Paymasters are an interesting aspect here. They could effectively be perhaps a different type of general for the Dogs of War army, although that's not what they were on the tabletop. On the tabletop, paymasters acted very much like something known as standard bearers. Now, for those of you who don't know, who don't have much exposure to the Warhammer tabletop, standard bearers effectively allowed you to re-roll and to have a higher leadership value, which meant your troops would be less likely to run away. If you had a standard bearer, your troops would take courage from that, and they wouldn't run away. Now, the principle is that with mercenary armies, all they don't care about pride of a flag or honor for fighting for your nation or anything like that. Mercs want to get paid. Show me the money. That's all mercs care about, and they've kind of taken that to heart. So mercenary armies often have this kind of ceremonial, although it's not really ceremonial, it does contain all of the army's money, pay chests. And they take these into battle, and these are always protected by someone known as the paymaster, who's in charge of not only dealing out all the cash to the mercenaries but also protecting all the cash from anybody who would look to take it so they're fiercely protective of this money and they tend to pay it out to the guys when they've done their jobs but the mercenaries take great heart if they can see the money they know that someone's not robbing from them they know that if they need to get paid it's there and so this is why the paymasters and the chest act as the standard bearer saving helping them do morale checks um for armies in the dogs of war because they're mercs they want to get paid, baby. That's all they're after. So this is a role that the paymasters do in the tabletop. Now, there's no real direct translation of this in Total War Warhammer, which is why I think there should be maybe making these guys a different type of general, because Dogs of War don't have a huge amount of potential for different types of generals. And so if you had mercenary generals, even if you had the melee and you had the even if you had the melee and you had a missile focused general, you're still maybe there's room there for one more, which could potentially be the paymaster, which would give a lot of morale boosts, I guess, to an army. 
Now, there's also a he not really a hero version of the Paymaster, but there's a downgraded version. So for people who are like, just use Paymasters as heroes, that's an also uh, something you could do. But you also have things known as Money Lenders, which we'll get into in a little bit. But Money Lenders are a hero unit, kind of the downgraded version of the Paymaster. This is what the Paymaster is. The guy, he protects the chest. He can look any kind of way he wants. There's a lot of different takes on the Paymasters. I'm not sure if there was ever an official model, except for outside the character I'm going to get into in a little bit, of what a Paymaster should look like. But it's essentially like, find a model for a chest, put a guy on top of it, you've got your Paymaster. As far as characters who are Paymasters, there's only really one, and that is Midas the Mean. Now, Midas's origins are steeped in mystery. I mean, some people just assume that he was some kind of sheikh who embezzled money from the Sultan, and the Sultan found out, and thus he was forced to flee and become a Paymaster in Tilia and the lands away from Araby. But this is kind of the idea of him. Midas is the chap on the left here on the slide. He's not the chap behind the money case. We'll get to him in a little bit. But Midas is the armored guy who protects the money, not just sitting there staring at the money. So Midas is guarding the money. He's very good at it. And he begins to rise to prominence in the pirate island of Sartosa. Now, on the island of Sartosa, he served under a dwarven pirate known as Gritty Scumbeard. And now, many of you are thinking of the other dwarven pirate I described my regiments for now, the Slayer Pirates, but that's not him. This is a different dwarven pirate known as Gritty Scumbeard, and he served under him, and Midas was notoriously stingy, thus earning his name Midas the Mean. He wouldn't even tell the dwarf sort of where he was sort of storing the money on off days and what he was using it for. So eventually, Scumbeard would eventually meet his fate in an encounter with a couple of Corsairs. So unfortunately, Scumbeard met his end. However, what he never realized in life was that Midas wasn't necessarily being miserly. What he'd effectively done was just move the treasure so that if any occasion happened, Midas would simply run away with it and just keep all the Paymaster's chest, which he did end up doing in the end. So after the encounter with Scumbeard, Midas moved around a bit and ended up in the service of a prince of Tilia known as Prince Groclo, I think it was, who was the prince of Verezzo. He ended up serving this prince, and by all accounts, he was serving him valiantly, proving a very effective paymaster who'd gone on to train a number of bodyguards to help him in his effort to protect the pay chest. Now, the thing that Minus did to recruit bodyguards was that he would buy slaves and then grant them their freedom. And he found that this was a way of really engendering huge amounts of loyalty amongst his bodyguard, and they would fight valiantly by his side until the very end. So this is how he built up his henchmen and his bodyguard to help him protect the pay chest. During the service to this prince, Midas and his bodyguard earned a reputation as being great protectors of the pay chest and really doing their job particularly well. However, as time went on, Midas would prove to be a hugely stingy paymaster. He'd underpay all the mercenaries that worked for him, pay them underneath the amounts they'd been contracted to, and this began to build up a huge amount of resentment within the army itself. At some point, that builds to uh, just a crescendo of violence where the mercenaries have had enough. They start to rebel against the prince. Different factions start to clash. It's absolute chaos. The prince tells Midas, Midas, we have to flee. This is anarchy. We should flee back to Verezzo. And Midas is like, yeah, boss, sure, I'll follow you. You go ahead. And the prince runs off. And Midas also runs off, but in completely the opposite direction with all of the money. And so since that day... Pulling this little scam, Midas has been an unwelcome visitor in Tilia itself, and so can't really return. And so he spends his time kind of traveling the world, plying his trade for different mercenary bands around the old world. So that's kind of where Midas finds himself at the moment. Midas has also been joined by his uh, moneylender pal, Sheikh uh, Yadosh. Now, Sheikh Yadosh was a guy who's thought to have lent money to Midas around the time of Sartosa, and has kind of been following Midas around until Midas is in a position where he can repay this huge sum of money lent to him. At least that's kind of the story that people believe. Now, Yadosh himself is a particularly hardy chap of huge girth and power, um, but he also has this huge cummerbund you can see in the image here, in painted purple in this model, and that's said to be just filled with coins, granting him a particularly good armor save. Well, not particularly good, kind of an average one if you ask me, but still an armor save for a guy who looks like he's just dressed in cloth. 
which is a pretty handy bonus, just because you've got so many coins stuffed into that cummerbund. He kind of goes around with Minus and lends money to the gamblers and the mercenary bands, guys who just need a little bit of extra cash. He's essentially the payday and loan guy, and then Midas is the guy who pays your salary. That's kind of how they double hit it, and they're making money off of both sides of the arrangement there. So these two, good at protecting a pay chest, but don't trust them unless you think you can catch up with them, because they will just take your pay chest most likely. Midas has a couple of magic items that can help him out as well. Probably most interestingly is his treasure map. Now this is a treasure map that he saved, let's say, from one of Scumbeard's uh, treasure chests when he, uh, you know, Rob took the burden of having all the treasure off the corpse of Scumbeard, and he just found this scroll and he started to mark down where he hid all the treasure chests he'd kind of made away with over the years. However, he'd kind of seen the back and he just thought they were kind of scrawlings of a demented wizard. However, what they were were markings of an ancient lizard man scroll. And what this scroll was was an ancient lizard man warrant of trust. And magic had been built into this scroll so that anyone who was holding it would be believed by whoever they were talking to. And this meant that Midas, who despite having a reputation for going around stealing treasure chests, not necessarily being the most trustworthy guy around, has always managed to convince people of what he's telling them. So he manages to talk people into contracts, he manages to do all these things, and that's because he carries around in his leggings this ancient lizard man warrant of trust. Now, if he ever actually realized what he could do, he would probably have taken over the whole world with a piece of magic paper that makes everyone believe you, but he hasn't. So he just kind of accidentally stumbles into these situations where gangs of mercenaries tend to believe him. Now, in the way this played out on the tabletop was the idea that Midas would make a promise to the mercenaries at the beginning of a battle, and that this would kind of carry on to give the whole army a bonus. So what you'd do is you'd roll the dice, and depending on what you got, different results would incur. On a 1 to 2, you'd get a bonus from the loyalty of your trusty henchmen, and this would mean that the bodyguards of Midas were able to defend the chest better, and got a bonus to hit, so essentially a melee attack bonus throughout that battle. Uh, if he rolled a 3 to 4, the idea would be he'd promised the army that the safe, the chest was uh, very safe in his hands, not to worry lads, which would take their morale bonus radius from a 12 inch to an 18 inch radius. It's just essentially increasing the radius of his morale buff, which could be a way to play it out in Total War Warhammer as well. And on a 5 to 6, um, his promise was if we win the battle, all the mercenaries will receive a bonus which gave a bonus to something known as Combat Resolution, which I've mentioned before, but effectively is a leadership buff of some kind to stop units running away. So that's the story of Midas the Mean, and it kind of got us into the hero section of this video as well, where we're discussing the role of moneylenders. So moneylenders are a hero in the Dogs of War army book, and uh, what they do is they kind of serve a morale function as well, essentially kind of boosting the abilities of the paymaster to help with re-rolls for morale saves and stuff like that. Um, it's very hard to translate, and that's why I think you could probably merge these two roles into one, really. Now, thinking about it a little bit more, paymasters wouldn't make great generals, because they're not really meant to be generals, but they could make a good hero in their own right. So you could have paymasters as heroes, and then perhaps split the generals into merchant princes and mercenary generals. I think that's a way you could split the generals of a Dogs of War army, looking back on it now, because I don't think paymasters are really suited for the role of a general. But that's paymasters, and we're going into heroes a little bit now, and we've covered moneylenders, but let's move on to the next next batch of heroes, which is the Hireling Sorcerers. Now, these guys, most usually just human sorcerers, um, you do get different types of sorcerers for Dogs of War armies. Like we've discussed in my Albion video, you get the kind of dark uh, sorcerers and the druids there who do different types of magic. And there are a number of other variations on magic users within Dogs of War armies, so it's not really just the basic winds of magic that we've seen in like the Empire army. But that's kind of the idea. It's just to get a sorcerer in there, someone who can do magic. 
Now, the most well-known of the hireling sorcerers in the Dogs of War army is a character we kind of mentioned when we were talking about Borgio the Besieger, but that is Lucrezia Belladonna. So, Lucrezia Belladonna, the sister-in-law of Borgio the Besieger, also thought of as perhaps the most beautiful woman in Tilia, if not the world. Don't let the model fool you, she's meant to be considered beautiful, guys. So, she is also known as the Arch Poisoner and the Mistress of Assassins. She's something of a Black Widow figure who has a string of dead husbands behind her. The first was Luigi, Prince of Pavona, who was assassinated, and Lucrezia, following his assassination, did everything she could to keep hold of his principality. In order to do this, she took up with a number of mercenary captains who had become her husbands, and in their own right, the Princes of Pavona. The first was a chap called Borso, who lost a battle, and then, um, I think, was mistakenly treated with poisonous herbs. Another was a captain by the name of Dundato, who assumed command of her army, won a fantastic victory against the Verizians, um, and they got married soon after. However, he would then go on to form an alliance with Trantio, uh, which you'll remember used to be the principality of Marco Colombo, against Borgio the Besieger, who of course was married to Lucrezia's cousin. Uh, sorry, not cousin, sister. And of course Lucrezia couldn't have this, and unfortunately he succumbed to a meal of poisonous toadstools. And it kind of goes on like this, and she's gone through a series of these horrific losses of husbands, however, never being directly involved with any criminality herself, of course. At one point, it's even said that in Bretonia, a Bretonian knight overheard someone saying that Lucrezia was the most beautiful woman in the world. He was like, of course not, it must be the Fae Enchantress, and then challenged the Tilian knight to a duel. Now, Lucrezia asked the Tilian knight, and rather suggestively written here, kissed the tip of his lance, and then the Tilian knight went into a joust against this Bretonian knight. So, the Tilian knight was actually hit and unhorsed, but he did manage to land a glancing blow versus the Bretonian knight. Now, the Bretonian knight, having ridden to the end of the jousting arena, kind of just slumped in his horse and died. And everyone was bamboozled by this, and they were like, oh, he's been poisoned. He's like, how could I do that? It can't have been poisoned. I just kissed the tip of his lance, and I didn't die so of course there was no poisoning happening and that's kind of how nefarious lucrezia can be most recently lucrezia has lost unfortunately her seventh husband who took ill after drinking a couple of bottles of wine that had gone bad and so she's perhaps on the lookout for another husband lucky number eight i'm sure he'll be all too eager to sign up but that's kind of the idea of Lucrezia. Through the use of poisons, through the use of her own magics, she's really looking to just secure power of her own principality, and she kind of has done successfully, although admittedly not really a huge message for feminism that she's had to do it with the help of men all the way through before discarding them rather unceremoniously. Now, she is obviously a magician, um, but she also has access to a, a number of different ways of poisoning people, and as such, rather than magic items, she has what are known as simply poisonous items. Now, the first of these is a poison file, and the idea is that she can randomly assign or grant wounds to an opposing character on the enemy side. The way this would work on the tabletop was that you'd roll a dice, and if... Any character, the first character who landed on a 1 or got a 1 on their roll of the dice, that character would take 2 wounds of poisoning before any of the battle had happened at all. So that's the idea, she's kind of poisoned someone before the battle starts. That'd be a hard thing to implement in Total War Warhammer. Um, I'm not really sure how they do that one, unless she could maybe have a infinite range attack that she had one use of that would start to cause direct damage against a single target. Maybe that's the way you could implement that poisoning idea. The next is the uh, poison stiletto. So it's a poison dagger she keeps in her garter, um, and it's covered with uh, toad venom and mushroom venom. And what it did on the tabletop was it allowed you to just roll one set of dice to hit and wound. Whereas for most people, you'd have to roll to hit, get above a certain amount, and then roll again to wound, again getting above a certain amount, depending on different statistics of the character. What this weapon did was it just mean you had to roll once, and that was it. Now, in Total War Warhammer, the only way to really translate that is probably to give poison damage and to um, have it be increased melee attack for the weapon itself. So that's a weapon that Lucrezia could have. Her final poison item was the Potion of Pavona, 
which essentially allowed her to buff up one of her statistics, and if she rolled a 1 when doing it, she would unfortunately take damage herself. But if she rolled anything else except a 1, she'd be able to add a point to any of her skills, which I think the player could pick, if I remember correctly. So those are the ideas of her poison items. She also has a couple of special rules. The first one is Stunning Beauty, which effectively means that any unit within six inches of her, so within a certain radius, would automatically rally. If they started running away, they'd be like, we can't abandon this beautiful woman. We must return to the battlefield. Come on, gentlemen, for the lady. And they charge back into battle. And the other is just the access to these poisonous items that she has. But that's the crazy Belladonna, a special hireling sorceress who can do a lot of damage with her poisonous items and is a hell of a looker as well uh, so a great addition to any army and you could also potentially make her a legendary lord if you really wanted to there's no reason why not um, but in the actual book officially she's only a hero character so worth bearing that in mind but it would do what creative assembly like doing which is provide a different type of legendary lord and one access to magic rather than the melee legendary lord so that's uh, Lucrezia Belladonna. So moving on from Lucrezia and the Hireling Sorcerers, uh, we also have the Mercenary Captain. Now these guys would effectively be your melee heroes that we've seen many times in the armies of Total War Warhammer. He'd probably be good at training your troops, lower the cost of recruitment, kind of self-explanatory, much like the Empire Captains. You'd have the Mercenary Captains, kind of very much the same thing. So no, we're not going to spend too much time on that. Um, so that's really the Mercenary Captains for you. So, moving on from the mercenary captains, we have one last character I want to talk about who doesn't really fit into any good niche. Now, this is a very different character in the Dogs of War army, and that is Leonardo da Miragliano. So, Leonardo is obviously based on Leonardo da Vinci. Now, he's not classed as a general, or really, I suppose he is a hero, but he's a unique kind of hero in the Dogs of War army book, in that he's simply classified as a genius. So he's not a wizard or a general or anything like that. And the idea is that Leonardo uses science and alchemy to do um, what he does on the battlefield. Now, as far as Leonardo's uh, origins, he's come from what are described as humble and obscure origins. But he's known to have always been a very intelligent guy. And eventually he found himself, when he was a much younger man, as an apprentice to the architect of the Prince of Cosimo. Now, the prince, having just one day going over with his architect to plan for some of the new buildings within his city, saw of some of Leonardo's sketches and quickly decided to kind of listen and hear out Leonardo and his plans and how he envisaged the city perhaps being built, and in fact very promptly named him a chief architect and put him in charge of designing the whole grand scheme of the redesign of his main city. And thus Leonardo quickly rose to prominence. In this role, he eventually ended up redesigning the whole of Miragliano itself, um, thus earning his name to a certain extent, and he devised a whole set of ramparts and new defences for the city, really kind of improving the whole city all around. He soon began to kind of spread his wings a little bit outside of architecture, and began to, you know, lend his services wherever he could, wherever his genius could be useful, and before long he started being the advisor to a number of mercenary generals. And this led for his fame to start spreading spreading far and wide as far as war engineering was going, and eventually words reached the Empire, and the Empire promptly enlisted the services of Leonardo, and he went to serve under the Empire for a while, and this is when he most famously, perhaps his most famous creation of all, was the foundation of the Imperial Engineering School, um, whereabout he was able to bring around some of his designs, perhaps one of the most famous of which is the steam tank, uh, which was his idea and his concept, and that's where the origins of the steam tank eventually came from. Over the course of the years, he would eventually travel around a bit more, pursue his hobbies. He was known for producing a vast amount of different war machine designs, a lot of which were never built, a lot of which are still traded hands for a lot of money within Tilia and the Empire and the wider Warhammer world itself, because um, he never really got around to building them all. He also lent his hand, he didn't leave architecture behind fully, and he's largely responsible for a number of the leaning towers of Tilia, which are everywhere, all around the place, and he really tried to challenge himself to see how sort of off-kilter he could build a tower without it fully collapsing, and there are truly some gravity-defying towers that are under his belt. Now, 
Now, a problem with Leonardo, much like uh, Marco Colombo, is that Leonardo, when he first entered the service of the Empire, that was some 500 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline, so he too has been long dead. But you never know, they might think of a way of resurrecting him. But just because of that, I think it's unlikely we might see Leonardo making an appearance in Total War Warhammer 2. Now, he did have some kind of fun rules on the tabletop um, in terms of how he played with all of his scientific items or what they were called. So he had an item which was known as the Sphere of Alchemy, which was essentially a grenade type of item, which he would lob and it would explode and cause a radius damage. And he also had something known as the Prism of Power, which was a glass prism that would seemingly suck away excessive winds of magic, and so it would allow him to take away magic spells from magicians. That was the role of the uh, Prism of Power. And his third one was the Compass of Meteoric Silver. And that was a way by which, the rules were kind of different back then when the uh, Dogs of War Army book was released, but it was a way in which you could have the opposing player tell you where their magic items were. Um, I'm not sure how you translate that into Total War Warhammer, really. Um, it's kind of a rule that doesn't even make sense in later editions of Warhammer itself. But um, that was what the Compass of Meteoric Silver did. So there we go. That was uh, Leonardo, the Met with the Miragliano. Yeah, he was a cool guy. He also had a couple of uh, special rules. Um, so he could, the idea was that he could specialize and help a general in one portion of the battle. He could either help in artillery, he could help with crossbow accuracy, or he could help with battle strategy. Now the idea was with artillery, he could re-roll a misfire dice. So if you rolled for your artillery to go off and something went wrong, you would get another chance to do that, and you could pick that bonus. Or you could increase crossbow accuracy, which allowed you to re-roll dice if your dice weren't high enough to hit their target for crossbows. So he could do that alternatively. And thirdly, with a battle strategy, he could pick an entire unit and essentially give them the ability to come on from a different side of the battlefield, allow them to flank around an enemy. It would be akin in Total War Warhammer to the kind of vanguard ability. Now, if we ever do see Leonardo, you could give him all three of these attributes. He could increase uh, accuracy of artillery, he could increase accuracy of missile units in general, and uh, you know what, why not allow him to have some units vanguard at the same time. That's kind of how he would probably play if they ever did translate him over into Total War Warhammer. But kind of a fun idea, fun notion, very kind of important character in the history of the Warhammer world. But as I said, he started serving the Empire some 500 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline, so he's probably long dead at this stage. Short of something weird, like them just writing in some odd reason that he's not for a Dogs of War army. So that's about it for Leonardo. And that kind of brings us to a close on the Legendary Lords for the Dogs of War, guys. Um, there are some honorable mentions I could put in, like I'd love to see a Commander Bernhardt lead a mercenary army in Total War Warhammer 2. But that's probably not likely to happen, as Commander Bernhardt, for those of you who don't know was the famous protagonist of the Shadow of the Horned Rat game and the Dark Omen game, which were two sort of precursors to, I'd say, even Total War as a whole, let alone the Total War Warhammer series. There's also, of course, Gotrick and Felix, uh, the legendary uh, heroes who'd go around together, and they became characters available in the Dogs of War. But that's about it for the Dogs of War, guys. As I said, there are some other characters who were added in later on through White Dwarf, which was the Warhammer magazine, but they never made it into the official army book when it was released, and that's where I sourced most of the material. But I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, do stay tuned for part three. That will be coming up. That will be covering Tilia and the more general units. And if you haven't already seen it, guys, do check the description below and give part one a watch. Um, but other than that, guys, thank you all for watching. And a special thanks to my patrons, Huli, Reese, Colin, Mateus, Samuel, Matthews, David, Peter, Sign of the Emperor, Niblets, Calef, Nigel, Hangster, Zelha, and James. Thank you guys especially and uh, I look forward to catching you all on the next one. Alright guys, bye.